perhaps the last couple of days, uh, maybe even this afternoon, you had some quiet time, maybe a little bit of downtime, and maybe you did spend some time to sort of think back over the past year. I've been trying to rack on my brain all the things that have happened to, at church here this year to, to write a year-end report, and I'll probably have to go back through the announcement sheets. Uh, but it's a time for us to sort of reflect and, and to think back over the past year, and maybe for a couple different reasons that we do this. First of all, first of all, is just sort of assess uh, what went well and maybe what needs to change. Uh, maybe another reason that uh, we would take time to reflect on the past is uh, to sort of celebrate, right, uh, the great things that have happened over the course of the year, uh, the victories maybe God has given you over a certain struggle in your life, uh, the countless blessings God continues to shower upon us, uh, not only as Christians, but as American Christians. Uh, and maybe a third reason to sort of take time to reflect and think of the new year and to think back over the past year is, as we recognize and assess what didn't work very well, we're going to adjust things and, and perhaps make some plans. We call them uh, New Year's resolutions. But the goal is to get better, right? To, to, to improve our life, uh, to do things better, to have more blessings or to have more accomplishments in life. Better health, it was always one of those things. Stronger relationships. Uh, better habits that would result in more godly living, as we want to thank our God for the ways that he's blessed us. And living in a world that's always changing, right? we're always thriving on more stability, uh, peace, uh, contentment that we might have in life. So, so if you've already done that, right, look back over the past year, uh, what kind of year was it? Would you say it was a, a good year? Things went well, or is it one of those years where you think to yourself, well, it can only get better? When you think about the, the, the last year, uh, is it a year where we look at all those resolutions that you made last year, if you can remember them, uh, and you think to yourself, well, maybe I'll just stick with the old ones. It's enough to work on, but maybe there's also some new ones that you want to work on. Um, of those resolutions, then, which are the ones that you feel are the most important uh, as you sort of prioritize plans that you have for the new year? What would be the most instrumental resolutions to help you make the most of each and every day of the new year? Well, as we would take time to think back over the course of a year, as Christians, we would recognize that two things sort of resonate loudly and clearly as we think of what has happened over the past year or years. Those two things comfort us, but they also encourage us and empower us for the new year. First of all, it's God's power in our lives and God's love. We recognize over the course of the year, once again, God has always been in control of things. Nothing has happened that he isn't aware of and nothing has happened that he hasn't allowed. But the other part of it is that each and every day this past year, when you have gotten down on your hands and knees in repentance, God has always forgiven you. Wonderful things from the past that comfort us, encourage us, and empower us for the year to come. Our first lesson for this evening to focus on and meditate on is found in Hebrews chapter 11. We call it the great faith chapter of the Bible. Uh, but as you recall, it teaches us about the past, about the people who lived in the Old Testament. It teaches us how God worked in and through the lives of his people. And it, it kind of serves as evidence to us uh, that God continues to work in our lives. And, and it really serves as a source of hope for us as we think of the world and the year to come and, and all the unknowable things. God is our hope. Listen then to Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. 
And by faith, he still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he commended the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each one of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith he cut the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. Women received back to their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and goatskin, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. 
With all the hopes and dreams of a new year come also the questions and the concerns of what really is going to happen. And we have learned over the course of time that we ought to expect the unexpected, right? The twists and turns uh, that we aren't ready for. And with this year, sort of a, well, not an odd year, but just one of those years with the election, there's always those concerns, that, that anxiousness people have with new leadership in the White House. And, and it really doesn't matter uh, which side of the aisle you stand on. And maybe it's uh, certain words that the doctor has shared with you, certain comments that he's shared with you, but that now all of a sudden, well, you think to yourself, maybe I should pay a little bit closer attention. And, and there's some worry, maybe some concern about what the new year may hold for you. Uh, as we watch the news, um, as we kind of see where our culture is going and, and how things are changing, it seems like from year to year, uh, a little bit of my anxiety grows as I think of my daughters uh, and, and young people and the world in which they live. And, and as they get older, they become more aware of the culture in which they live. Uh, if anything, it, it kind of feeds for more fervent prayers. But if we're honest with ourselves, we, had kind of, we would admit that oftentimes we lose focus, we lose heart when it comes to the new year. As positive as we might be and as hopeful as we might be of good things to come, uh, maybe those words of Jesus uh, sort of linger in the back of our minds. The love of most will grow cold. There'll be wars and rumors of wars. Well, when that anxiety sort of grabs us and, and holds us captive, it's almost as if we've sort of omitted one word from that prayer that our Savior Jesus taught us to use regularly. Remember where he tells us, he instructs us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Now, we've been taught in confirmation class Bible class, that that's talking about physical needs, and Jesus is making the point, you don't have to worry about clothes or food or, or shelter, and I, I take care of the birds, I'll take care of you. Um, but maybe there's some wisdom for us to think about all the other requests in the Lord's Prayer that deal with spiritual needs, and, and put that word daily in there. Right? That day by day, uh, we trust our loving Savior to provide spiritual nourishment for what we're going to face, the unexpected, the expected. Right? That, that we would pray with the Lord's Prayer, knowing and trusting uh, there's not going to be any problems that Jesus can't overcome. And, and when we have those problems, we can always turn to him and know he's going to listen. Because the reality is, you and I have limited control over what's going to happen in 2017. Day by day, there are things that we sort of have control, but other things... We're just maybe even flying by the seat of our pants. But we do have, though, in our possession, some very pertinent, powerful knowledge that helps us prepare for each and every day of the new year. We have this very pertinent, powerful information, this knowledge that will never let us down. So wisdom would teach us then to hold on to Jesus, to hold on to his words to begin each day with these powerful words of his forgiving love that comfort us and encourage us, but also confident in the power of his word to provide for us and to protect for us, protect us. I invite you now to stand as we listen to these words of our Savior Jesus recorded in Luke chapter 12. Please stand. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is sown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? 
and do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no mouth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. By now you've maybe made some New Year's resolutions. And again, maybe you've thought about the ones that you've made in the past. But when it comes to New Year's resolutions, maybe it's safe to say uh, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Right? The intentions are there. The intentions are well meant, but the follow-up, the follow-through, the follow-up uh, leaves much to be desired. And maybe that's because uh, you've gotten a year older and some of these goals just make you plain tired when you think of them. Maybe you've come to realize that when it comes to things in, in life, in your life, well, maybe they're just not going to happen. Or, or maybe you've come to realize that some of these goals maybe aren't as important as they used to be. And so you are willing, maybe you're eager to at least cross one thing off of your resolution list. Well, with the new year comes what we also might call Christian resolutions, that we would grow in our faith, right? Uh, that we would uh, find new ways or continue to express our thankfulness to God, his grace and his mercy, as we would serve him in different ways and various ways. As we think of our New Year resolutions, though, we would have to admit, yeah, the Spirit is willing. Right? We really want to do these things when we think of the cross and the empty tomb and the gift of heaven that awaits all of us. But maybe we also would say that the flesh is strong, right? the sinful nature that still lives inside of us. A year from now, Lord willing, as we would gather in God's house to celebrate another year of his grace, you're still going to come, perhaps, ashamed of the sins, the old sins that you did again. And you probably will come sort of embarrassed of the problems that you caused. You might be angry with some of the sins that you never thought in, the, in, in, in all the world that you would ever commit, that you would ever do. And perhaps by this time next year, you will be struggling with some of the consequences that have come as a result of sinful behavior. Our third and final lesson for us this evening, it's recorded there in Jeremiah chapter 29, become a great source of comfort and joy as we consider the fact that as much as we want to live as God's people, 2017 will be filled with sin and sorrow and sadness over the things that we have done. The, the, the amazing thing about the ministry of Jeremiah is that he was a prophet of God sent to tell God's people uh, that, yeah, they were going to be punished for their rebellion in a very awful way. But there was always that silver lining that Jeremiah was there to share with God's people. Even though they sort of got what they deserved when they were banished into slavery for 70 years, there was always that promise of God to restore them and to deliver them and, and free them from that slavery. And so this evening, as you think of the new year, excitement perhaps, but then maybe some anxiety, a little bit of concern about what's going to happen, realizing that as much as you want to do uh, things that please God, make him happy, there'll be your, you'll have your days. Uh, I want you to listen now and then enjoy and, and take to heart this beautiful promise God gives to you. It's sort of like his New Year resolution. Uh, and we know he always keeps his resolutions. In Jeremiah chapter 29, he says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. 
You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. This is the word of the promise.